Boy, do we have a good show for you today. In today's episode, we just give you six simple steps that can help you crush your fitness goals. And here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Powerlift. We're going to give away a free program to one of you viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to the entire MAPS Power Lift program. By the way, it's free access for life. Also, this month, we have put together three workout bundles for three different types of people. Beginners, intermediate, and advanced. So three bundles, each one perfect for one of those people. And the bundles include nine months, each one, nine months of exercise programming. And the discount price is tremendous. Each one of them, huge sale, huge discount for nine months of exercise programming, okay? If you're interested, head over to mapsjanuary.com. One more time, it's mapsjanuary.com. One more thing, we're also making MAPS Anabolic, that's one workout program, 50% off. So if you just want to try one program, try MAPS Anabolic. It's half off right now. Just go to mapsred.com, and then the code for that one is January 50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, guys, so here's the deal, right? We're uh, beginning of the year. Everybody's getting started with their fitness, or a lot of mm. people have been working out, but now they're getting real serious. I want to do an episode where we give people like very plain, simple tips that are effective. Like just do these things yeah, and you'll get a lot of the way the there. bare bones approach. Yes. I, I love this idea of mine. I seriously think that this is... <laughs> It's really good. Sometimes you really nail it, Adam. <laughs> it's really no, good. actually, I think then, this is actually a really good uh, idea for an episode because one of the, probably, and I would well, like to hear your guys' opinion, but I think one of the biggest mistakes um, that I would see with clients in the new year is coming in and overthinking this process. Totally. Um, overthinking it, overdoing it. Uh, and inevitably burning themselves out. Even the ones that saw temporary or good results immediately end up not sticking to it. And anybody who's getting started right now, right, with New Year's resolution, I would imagine that their goal is not just to lose the 20 pounds or just to get in shape right now and then to put it all back on or fall out of shape. I think the idea is that you uh, make changes for the rest of your life. And so giving people very practical, realistic, and easy, simple steps to follow, and that could make the greatest impact. I think it's a great episode. And it all starts with the solid foundation. So what does that foundation look like that you can build upon? I think that's the part that gets like looked over the most and like how can we get as quickly to our goal as possible? So. Yeah, I remember as, as, a, I mean, as a trainer, you, you really start to learn how like what single steps produce the biggest impacts and when they're as measured by the impact it makes in the short term, but also in the long term, and how easy is it for people to adhere to? Those are the three most important factors. And you really start to piece this together when you train people day in, day out, year after year, after a couple decades, you start to say, okay, you know, this advice, although it would work, it doesn't work because people have a tough time sticking to it, or it's too complicated, or it's asking too much of them. So let me put it this way, and you know, this is the advice that I've seen be the most successful. So, and I know we have those things, right? We have the things that we know just move the needle the most. Like, <clears throat> for example, if you're trying to make a car go faster in the quarter mile, and you have a regular car that you bought, like, there's a lot of things you could do, but you know, a turbo probably does more than an exhaust and it headers and all these other parts and whatever. It's just one thing that makes the biggest impact, right? So, and I know there's, there's steps that just have the biggest impact. They're the easiest to stick to things that we've seen through experience to be the most effective. You know what I also like about this is we narrowed it down to six things, but when I look at the list, I admittedly got at least five of these six things wrong as a, as an early trainer. Like when we look, if you look at that list right now <clears throat> and think about the advice that you gave around that top, that specific topic or thing that we're going to address um, I think I gave bad advice, even as a trainer. Totally. So not just like a young kid trying to work out and figure this thing out for himself, but even as a certified, experienced trainer, uh, I was I was wrong on a lot of these things. And so I think that's why this episode uh, will have tremendous it's, value for a lot of people. I think all of us went through that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know what it reminds me of? There's that, uh, what's that quote uh, from Bruce Lee? It says, uh, don't fear the man who practices a thousand kicks once, a thousand different kicks once, but practice the man who practices one specific type of kick 
a thousand times, right? It's like those basics. And you learn this in lots of different practices. Like the, in, you, when you initially learn how to play a sport or do something, you want to learn all the fancy moves and all the crazy mm -hmm. techniques. But then when you do it long enough, you go way back and you say, oh, it's these fundamental basics that you have to master. You know, it's these fundamental basics that you master that makes you really good. It's not all these complexities. And so the steps that we're about to talk to you require the least amount of tracking, the least amount of record keeping. The least and, amount of work. At least amount of work because that's a, such a huge stumbling block for people. It's such a huge, you know, it's a wall that gets in people's way because when I tell people to track and keep records and do all these different things, although it would be great if they did, the reality is it's just it's well, just adding more simple, challenge. Simple, but they have massive effect on behavioral changes, and I think that's what we learned in our careers was like, what are those few things that have that kind of impact where you can see that change within your clients uh, that they really grab onto versus you know trying to inundate them with so many different techniques and so many things to incorporate. Yes. Now the first one, man, when this finally clicked for me as a trainer. It was like magic. I was so excited because it was so simple and so silly and yet so effective that when I would have clients do this, we would see results on the scale, in the mirror, they would feel better. And their response was really what, what, what sold me on this. Their response, they'd come back to me and say, what's happening mm -hmm. to my body? As if it was like this mysterious magic that yeah. was happening. Mm -hmm. And that it was to tell my clients with, when it comes to diet, don't worry about almost anything else, all I want you to do right now is only eat whole natural foods. Yeah. Stay away from heavily processed foods, foods that come in boxes and wrappers, foods with long shelf lives. Main, only eat or mainly eat whole natural foods and then let's see what happens. And here's what would always happen. Naturally, and we have there's studies that support all of this and we'll get into it, right? They would naturally reduce their calories. They would naturally increase their nutrient intake. They would naturally increase their protein intake uh, from doing this, and we would see people lose weight and feel better, and they wouldn't feel like they were restricting. Yeah, that was you're, a not, big one. you're not being restrictive with this mindset at all with your clients. It's more seeking out and finding these whole foods to incorporate, which then actually changes your palate. It starts to sort of do its work on you without being so obvious. Yes. Well, yeah, subconsciously, I think that they naturally start to make better choices for themselves, and they don't feel like they're being restricted or told they can't do anything and they just kind of start to f follow better steps mm -hmm. to make them healthier but i also want to address the things that we did wrong in these categories too right totally. so like one of the things that i would do that i thought was right at the time was right out of diet for yes. somebody yeah. someone come in they hire me i want to lose 20 30 pounds and it was all about the calories that's right it was you know let's let's weigh you out let's get all let's get very mathematical about this and figure out what you need to do precisely to get to the but it was the math was just the answers none of the math that's right it was it was it was just the answers to the test and what they what ends up happening even if there's somebody who can stick to it so i would get this false signal that this is the way to do this because some clients would right you know one at every four or five would stay locked in, would follow the steps, follow the meal plan, get great results, and hey, I'm a good trainer. But the truth is, like, they still don't know how to do that on their own, and inevitably, even those people end up putting that weight yeah. back. And you're on still later talking on. about 25 percent or less. That's right. Of your clients actually doing anything. No, here's what's interesting about um, whole natural foods: processed foods. Most of the money and the innovation and the research that goes into processed foods goes into making them hyper palatable. And so they, they make you overeat. These foods naturally make you overeat. And studies are very clear on this now that people will eat about five to 600 more calories a day just from even eating heavily processed foods. In other words, if they stopped eating heavily processed foods and just ate until they were satisfied, but made it only whole natural foods, they would get this natural, okay, without trying, that's the important thing here, without really trying to reduce their caloric intake, they would naturally eat 500 to 600 less calories. Now, we've heard throughout the decades that uh, fat was the culprit. This is why we have an obesity epidemic. Then it was carbohydrates or sugars. Mm -hmm. The truth is, it's heavily processed foods. If you look at the rise in obesity in modern societies, you look at America, for example, and as it goes up, you can put a graph of the percentage of our diets that was heavily processed foods, and you'll notice that they match almost perfectly. As our diets became more and more predominantly dominated by heavily processed foods, obesity 
grew and grew and grew. And again, think of it this way: eating a, a family bag, you know, size chips, a bag of chips, mm -hmm. is not that hard to do. But eating that many potatoes, plain potatoes, which is typically about five or six potatoes, would be very difficult to do. That's the power of heavily processed foods. And so if you just avoid those foods, you don't even have to consciously try to restrict. You naturally eat less. Well, and you can't really blame a lot of these companies that have produced these products because the consumers are the one driving oh, yeah, those make money. demands. Because of course. They're the ones that want everything to taste better, to be crunchier, yes. to you know have these like bright colors and flavors and um, and so it really is is our responsibility to bring back um, the association with what uh, you know these healthy, whole, natural foods provide your body, and focus on that aspect, and not specifically just on the flavor of it. And by the way, keyboard warriors can you know save their energy and fingers here that you don't need to get on here because I know someone's going to jump all over you for saying that it's processed foods that cause the obesity epidemic, and like it's not the only reason why. It's in our experience of all the people that we've helped out that it's one of the biggest reasons why people struggle with that. It's not the only one. Yeah, There's no, other yeah. factors with transportation and higher calorie meals that people are eating and more people are sedentary and there's a lot of other things that play a role in that but i agree it's with a you. major contributor it's the we've main all one. seen yeah. uh is a common factor in our clients it's the main one and they've done studies to show that it's not yes we're less active that definitely uh contributes to worse health outcomes but it's not the calorie burn side of the formula it's the calories inside of the formula where, where, where things have changed i mean the average person just eats a lot more now did our appetites increase? No. We're now eating foods that that make us not full as fast or satisfied as fast. Like I said, I could eat a whole bag of potato chips and not a problem. I could not eat that many plain potatoes. And this is true for, I mean, try to eat a thousand calories worth of apples versus a thousand calories versus apple flavored candy, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a big, there's a big difference. And so when, when it comes to diet, if you just cut out heavily processed foods, <clears throat> And don't even worry about calorie tracking and restricting or whatever. I used to tell my clients this, eat until you're satisfied, just eat a whole And they used to look at me like I was crazy. What do you mean? Eat yeah, yeah, I don't care. Eat as much steak and chicken and potato and you know, uh, you know, know, rice and fruits and vegetables as you want um, and just eat until you're satisfied and then we'll see what happens. And all of them, all of them, if they did that, would come back to me and be shocked mm -hmm. that they were actually getting leaner and they were shocked because they didn't feel like they were restricting because they're natural systems of satiety were allowed to work with foods that we evolved eating. I would say the next step is the only thing that I would add to that conversation, right? Is that you, if I, a hundred percent of the people that I gave that advice to saw a tremendous success, the, the, the few people that didn't see as good of results, it always came back to this step right here, which was they were, yes, eating all whole foods, but they weren't paying attention to how much protein they yes. were intaking. And so we were doing the strength training and we were under grossly under consuming protein, even though our calories were fine. We weren't putting on any bad weight. We also weren't building any muscle, yeah. which wasn't helping or supporting their metabolism any or helping their body composition. So simply by giving them the advice of, listen, just hit your body weight, like your your grams of protein in your body weight, right? So what if you weigh 150 pounds? Try to hit 100, hit 150 gra yeah. grams of protein. And by the way, that's not the, the, the science is 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8, but like you tell a client 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8, yeah. and they're not going to bust a calculator out every time. So them eating one gram to one pound of body weight is a great place. It's for, a good target. Yeah, it's an easy target for them to focus on and figure out if they're under or over. And I think that right there in it, itself, between that and the uh, no processed foods, I mean, if you got 100% compliance on that, those people saw oh, tremendous I, results. That's, it would be, I would say those two things are 85 to 90% of the way there when it comes to nutrition. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to be clear. You're not going to get 5% body fat like that. You're not going to look shredded on stage or look like your favorite Instagram fitness influencer. That requires, you know, really crazy, you know, weighing of food and counting calories and all that <clears> stuff. <throat> I'm talking about taking your body from overweight to relatively lean, you know, 13% body fat for a man, 12% body fat for a man, for a woman in the low 20s, maybe even below 20%, some women will get just by doing these things. Now, why protein, right? Why are we saying eat? that much protein. Well, here's why. There's a couple there's a few different reasons why. One is it it's very strongly positively connected to muscle growth, okay? So, if you eat more protein, you build more muscle, you're stronger, 
and that increases your metabolic rate. So now you get a faster metabolism, faster than you would had you not eaten as much protein. So that works in your favor. The second reason is protein is very satiety inducing. Of all the of the three main of the three macronutrients, right? Proteins, fats, and carbs. Proteins make you full the fastest. So if you've ever talked to anybody who's done the crazy carnivore diet, ask them about that and they'll tell you, oh my oh, God, yeah. I, I could not eat anymore. It's insanely difficult uh, to to get the, the amount of calories that you're probably eating before going on a crazy diet like that. Just because of that fact alone, it's just... It just it just makes you so uh, full, like almost uh, you know within within a few uh, meals. I would yeah. argue that it's almost it's impossible unless you're at least getting some uh, you know fatty proteins like steak and like even you know, like that. Because you know if hard you ate, you, I know even like that. It's that's just what I'm like saying. Exhausting. That's why I said it'd be impossible yeah. if you're eating chicken breast, fish, and turkey. Yeah. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Good luck getting enough calories in unless you're deep frying it or something else. But if you're eating it just whole whole natural chicken turkey fish meat like that you got to find ways to add the fat in there so you get some calories well, that's why i like to focusing on it first is like the main part of the meal is as you go through that and then if especially if you're trying to kind of cut back a bit on calories and uh, it's kind of a natural limiter uh that you put in place that yes way. now and protein another thing about protein is it's got a thermogenic effect in comparison to the other macronutrients meaning protein uh, actually gets your body to burn more calories per gram than fats or carbohydrates. So, you know, at, at risk of being a little too, you know, silly with this, it's somewhat of a fat burning macronutrient in comparison. In fact, there's studies where they'll overfeed people by about 400 calories, proteins, fats, or carbs. And when people are overfed calories and proteins, it's actually quite resistant to, to fat storage. It's actually harder to store body fat when you're eating more calories and proteins than fats or carbohydrates. And that just highlights the effect uh, that proteins have on the body. So if you're eating just whole natural foods and you're aiming for your body weight in protein, the high odds are you're going to eat in a calorie deficit, which is going to make you lean, and you're going to be eating enough protein to also simultaneously help you build strength and build muscle. Now, this next one was is contested. Uh, in fact, I was uh, somebody that would contest this in the past until I really started to understand the behavioral effects of this next step. So this next one is a little bit of a, a bro science uh, piece of advice. Bodybuilders have set up for a long time, but there's a reason why they've set it for a long time, and we'll get into that. And that, the advice is to drink a gallon of water a day. Now, a gallon is a lot, so we could even say a half a gallon to a gallon of water. So if you're smaller, half a gallon if you're a bigger person. <laughs> A gallon of water a day. Now, the, the the way that it was sold before was, well, the protein flushes things out of the body and your body holds on to less water and it's hydrating and it's anti-inflammatory and all that stuff, which is true when you compare being hydrated to not being so hydrated. But here's the real value, I think. If you're drinking a gallon of water a day, you're probably not drinking other stuff that's got calories. Yeah. And a very big percentage of people's calories or a, a percentage that makes a difference comes from liquid yeah. calories, wine, beer, you know, it staves uh, off soda. A, lot of, a lot of the uh, cravings yeah. you'll experience. Uh, I've noticed that too. And if I'm a little bit dehydrated, I my body gets the signal like I need to feed myself with with something that's like sweet or, uh, uh, you know, I get I get more tendencies towards like wanting to eat like these uh, process type foods. Along those lines, that was some generic advice I heard a long time ago that I've actually applied and think it's extremely valuable is like before going into dinner or if you start to have cravings is to go pound like a glass or two of water. Totally. And many times that'll completely like- Isn't oh, that weird? Yeah, it'll it's eliminate strange. it. Or then when you go into eating the meal, you don't eat nearly as much. So I agree with you. I, you could add in this too, as stupid as it may sound, but you're peeing all day long. So you got to get up and go to the restroom, get up and go to the restroom. There Especially for a factor. guy like me who's got a small bladder. So I end up peeing like 15 times in the day. So all those extra steps and movement, and I'm thinking about something like I'm not thinking about cravings or other stuff. I'm thinking about getting my water down. Like I love that, and I didn't experience that until I got into competing and had had to hit those targets because I was manipulating water in my body and tracking and paying attention. And I was like, wow, this has helped me stay eating good versus me sitting there. And the other thing, Justin, I heard Justin say this to a client years ago when we worked together um, that was complaining of low energy. 
Um, yep. And I was guilty of this, of starting my day off and not really having any water right at first. And so all from all night long. So I was a little dehydrated um, and then feel a little slow in the morning. And starting a day off with like a you know glass or two of water, I would feel it like kind of kick up my energy, and I thought that mm -hmm. was really interesting because I was like, "What mechanism is happening here where my body feels energetic from this?" It didn't make sense well, to me. Your body's going to want to conserve energy to prevent you from losing more water. Yeah. So if your water, your your if you're in that slightly dehydrated state, it's natural that your body's uh, you know energy levels are going to dip a little bit. Well, um, and you you you're able to to um, I, I know like I a lot of my clients experience brain fog. Yeah, uh, and this was another factor to that when they're dehydrated, where that was a contributor <laughs> that they didn't realize, and and also joint pain was another one that I've noticed. Like you know, it, it had an effect in terms of like I noticed that for effect. myself. Yeah, joint. I get more joint pain if I don't drink it. I start to notice I'm stiff, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, oh yeah, I haven't been drinking you know my normal amount of water. Yeah. The biggest thing though is like I, I would. It was funny too. I would have clients that would drink soda, and I'd say, they'd say to me, "Do you want me to cut the soda out?" And no, I'd say, just no, tell, just drink the gallon. Just of make water. sure you drink a gallon of water. Yeah, yeah. And then what they would do is they would bring a gallon of water to work. And I would advise them to do this because how do I know if I have a gallon? I said, let's get you a gallon container, yeah. bring it to work so you can see where you're at. And then they'd come and, you know, they'd talk to me after a couple of weeks of this and they'd say, I, I'm not drinking the Pepsi anymore. And I'm like, well, how come? I'm like, well, I don't have any room for the Pepsi because I got to finish <laughs> all the water. And I would laugh because. Yeah. That was the goal the whole time. Yeah. So it does. It does reduce. Think about that. If you're listening right now and you do drink some of your calories, you're probably not going to drink as many of your calories as you normally do because you're worried about drinking more water. So it's, it's almost like a sneaky way of cutting those calories. But it also does, on its own, reduce appetite, uh, help with inflammation, and improve your energy level. So well, along those lines, it's very similar to the protein thing. That's why, like, I love the focusing on protein because a lot of people don't hit protein targets, and having them just focus on protein ends up naturally yep. eliminating all the other foods. I think water works the same way too. It's like if you've never really focused on targeting a gallon of water, simply doing that starts to eliminate all this other bullshit that you're having. Same thing goes for the protein. You know, just not telling a client you can't have this, you can't do that. Hey, just hit your protein intake every single day. Just them focusing on that they naturally eliminate mm -hmm. all the other starchy type of carbs yes. now this next one is has to do with exercise resistance training in particular but it's it's very simple advice and that is to to lift weights for your whole body three days a week now yes you can also do about two days a week depending on your how experienced you are but so i'll say two to three days a week but if you lift weights three days a week that's i mean that for most people whose goals are just general fitness you're going to get, you can get so far with that. And it's so funny. It took me so many years to figure this out. I mean, I was, I've been working out since I was 14, obsessed with it. And I looked at all the routines, the workout. And at one point, you know, in my career, I started to read about the training routines of the lifters in the early 1900s. I mean, these were people that had incredible feats of strength, incredible physiques. This was before supplements even existed, let alone anabolic steroids and all that stuff. And I'm like, man, I wonder how they worked out. I wonder if they wrote the workouts. And I had no idea that they had written books. So I actually found a website and I found all these old books that were written by these old strong men and, and strength athletes. And I was shocked to see that they all trained their whole body three days a week. They would lift three days a week. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if I do that. And this is coming from someone who's a six day a week body part split type routine. I did this and I got the best results of my entire life. Until this day, I kind of train in a similar way. In fact, MAPS Anabolic, uh, part of it is modeled after the you know what I'm talking about right now. That's it. I mean, if you go to the gym and do one exercise per body part a few days a week, you're gonna get you can get very far doing that. Well, mm -hmm. since this episode is about the you know basically giving people the most basic least amount of work that they have to do to get the most amount of results, I'm gonna go out and on a limb and even say one time to three times a week because. If you do all these other things that we're listing right now and you only strength train full body one day a week, you would actually get in very good shape. You'd be fine. Three times a week, you can build an incredible body. Right. You know, so if you're talking about somebody who has goals of like, you know, putting themselves in the best shape of their life and looking ripped, like you absolutely can do that three times a week with all the piece of advice. But it, let's say, say you're not a, you know, you know, barbell, dumbbell person and you don't really care about building lots of muscle and, hey, I just want to be healthier than I was in 2021 and I know that strength training is important, so what's the least amount I need to do? You're doing a full body routine once a week, incorporating the other things we're talking about, you'd be pretty goddamn I, healthy. I trained at least half of my clients like that. Yeah. At least half. These are people that were with me for seven years, eight years, 10 years would come see me 
one day a week. Now, that doesn't mean they weren't active the rest of the week. You know, they made sure to stay active the rest of the week. But structured resistance training, they'd lift with me once a week and we do full body. Doug, when he hired me, Doug came to me and he had lots of experience with resistance training. And I had him lift twice a week, full body, two days a week. And he hit PRs and strength and muscle that he'd never hit before. And that's because it's a very effective way of training. You train your body, your whole body means you're not going to skip a body part. You focus on compound lifts. You get stronger. You send that signal to your body that says we need muscle, which speeds up the metabolism. At the very least, prevents you from losing muscle as you get leaner. And you, and you get great results. And it doesn't require a lot of time. People spend so much time working out because it's so ineffective and inefficient. So they spend all this time working out to get a little bit of results. When in reality, if it was an effective routine that was smart, you could spend far less time and get far better results. And that's what these full body workouts do. And again, our flagship program, MAPS Anabolic, is based off of this because it's so effective. And I say flagship, it's the most popular program that we have by far. So it's not, it doesn't have to be super complicated. Just a few days a week in the gym, go in, each body part, one exercise, and uh, and you're golden. Now, this next one has more to do with cardio. And this this was another one that was a, a such a big game changer for my clients. This one, it took me a long time to figure out. I would say towards the end of my career did I really piece this together. Because when I would recommend activity to people, I would say things, and before this, I would say things to people like, you know, do 30 minutes of cardio upon waking, or get a stationary bike, put it in your bedroom, or yeah. go to the gym, or go to the track, or whatever, and make sure you do your 30 minutes of activity. And it, it, it was hard to keep people consistent. I thought, oh, it's a discipline issue, or these people are lazy, or what's going on? And it wasn't until I realized, wait a minute, uh, there's no reason to do all 30 minutes of activity all at once. What if they divided it up? Spread and then, it out. Yeah, and then the second part was, what if I just attached it to like things that they're going to do anyway? So what if I had them walk for 10 minutes after <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And the adherence exploded. People were way more consistent, mm -hmm. and there was their 30 minutes of activity <coughs> every single There's day. There's so many other factors to that, too, in terms of benefits uh, that you can foresee from that. So digestion was a big one for yes. me. and. Um, you know, just, you know, the natural process of your body kind of moving things along and then being out in nature. If you can do it uh, instead of indoors, you get the benefits of the sun and vitamin D. Also, if you have, you know, a significant other that you bring with you, now you have conversations with them uh, that we've had meaningful conversations or the kids come with, you know, you get the dogs out. So yeah, I'm a big fan of doing things like that attached to uh, rituals or uh, processes during your day that you're already going to do anyways. Now you're just adding one little step that, you know, really sticks. I vividly remember when this light bulb went off, the conversation I was having with a client. This was uh, when 24 Hour Fitness introduced the body bug. And, um, you know, up until this point, I was like you, Sal, you know, 30 minutes of cardio and, you know, being, and I would, you know, specifically, you know, 30 minutes on Stairmaster and this day we're going to do hit. And I'd have all these like, yeah. you know, things that when they come in and train with me, I would prescribe very specific, you know, pieces of cardio that I'd have them do. And then I would at the, uh, you know, following week, I would assess and look at their body bug, which this is basically a, a, a you know, step and calorie burn tracker, right? A metabolism tracker. And I'm looking to see what, what our activity level looks like. And I remember looking up with this client of mine and she had on, on Friday when she didn't see me or Friday or Saturday, I don't remember what it was. It was one of those days where she didn't see me and she had the highest calorie burn by, by mo. Yeah. And I, I said, that's all the same thing. What did you do? You know, did you, could, did you train? Did you go back? No, I didn't even work out that day. I'm like, what do you mean? And I made her like walk me through a day. She, well, you know, I did this and I went, I had to go grocery shopping and then, I got home for a little bit, did something with the kids, and then I had to clean house. And I was just, I was blown away by how how much more calories that she burned by just kind of going through her day, walking around, doing normal activities in comparison to the hour that I was crushing her and the half hour, hour of cardio that I had prescribed to her. And I was fascinated by that. And it, this light bulb went off like, man, if I can just, if I can get my clients to, add in activity and make it very basic and simple and easy boy can i really make up the the calorie difference just from simply doing that without having to tell them to do this rigorous half hour to an hour on a stairmaster or a treadmill i did the same thing i remember the, the body bug used to have this graph that you could see with activity 
And so you'd see like it would spike up and, you know, come back down and spike up. And so you could see, oh, that you were, oh, at 8 a.m. It looks like you were real active. What were you doing? And, you know, all that stuff. Same same experience. I, they, they brought it in. I looked at their graph and I noticed Saturday they burned tons of calories. And I saw the graph and it was funny because on the weeks that they would see me, they would come in the morning. I'd see the spike of activity when they'd see me and then the rest of the day it was flat. Because why? They'd go to work, sit at their desk. And then after they were done with work, drive home and then, you know, sit on the couch or whatever. And so, but on Saturday, it was like up there. I'm like, what happened? Like, oh, we went to the mall and we went shopping. We were out there for like six hours. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. So you weren't working out. You were just walking and moving and you burn more calories than the day, than the days you work out with me because you work out with me for an hour and then you do nothing all the day. So this 10 minute breakup three times a day, number one, it, it's 30 minutes of activity. <clears throat> it does help with, insulin sensitivity it does help with digestion because it's post what they call postprandial right so it's mm -hmm. right after you eat um, it does break up the day and also there are studies that show that you know activity that's broken up actually is more effective at fat burning than than the same amount of activity all done at once they've actually done some studies to show that and they kind of lean in that direction that instead of doing 30 minutes all at once doing three 10 minute sessions actually is a little bit more effective but the most effective thing about it is it's attached to what you already do, and it doesn't sound so hard. Oh, walk 10 minutes after I eat? No problem. Well, there's a simple explanation for that, too, though. Like, and anybody who's done this has felt this. You ever notice how, like, you know, if you had a day where you're just, you know, it's raining, you feel tired, lethargic, and you could just, ah, I don't feel like doing anything, and you could sit for five, six hours with moving very yeah. little. Take a day like that, and you interrupt it at the, you know, two-hour mark, and you just go do a trigger session or go do a 10-minute walk, and then pay attention to your activity level after that. You naturally just move more. You're more active. Yeah. yeah. yeah when more you're, energetic. When, you're, when, you're, when those energy levels and you get in that sedentary place, like even just your, your, your ticks and your behaviors are all low and slow, and you're not moving yep. around. You go, and, you, and that's what I used to love about the trigger sessions. I remember when you, you put those in anabolic, and the first time that I applied that, one of the things I loved was, oh, I got to do these trigger sessions three days or three times in a day just for like five to 10 minutes. But it wasn't those trigger sessions that I thought I got the most value from, from the actual trigger sessions. It was how I felt afterwards. Mm -hmm. It would energize me. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I was so lethargic on the couch. I didn't want to do anything. And I was like, oh, I got to do that trigger session. I, I, I'm committing to that right now. So I get up, I do it. And then I didn't want to sit back down on the couch. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, now I'm up, I'm moving, blood flow, heart rate got up a little bit. Then all of a sudden it would make me want to go do things that were more physical and mm -hmm. active. So I think there's tremendous value in that. And you talk about the fat burning effects. I think more of it comes from what it promotes you to do afterwards because you've now increased that energy, blood flow, oxygen, and now you want to go and do stuff. I would, I would agree. Yeah. I definitely noticed that as well. So this next one uh, has to do with sleep. Now, you've probably, if you've listened to the podcast, you know how important sleep is and sleep quality is to for your body's ability to burn body fat and adapt and build muscle and Balance for your hormones out. youthful hormone levels, all that stuff, right? But just saying that, I think you get a little people a little confused. What does that look like? What are the things I need to do? Here's something you can do that is the single, in my opinion, though the single step that can ensure good quality sleep more than almost any other single step. Now, sleep can be complex, and there's a lot of moving factors. But if you just do this, you're you're more guaranteed a good night's sleep than almost any other single step. Sleep, uh, step. And that is to have a sleep routine. So what is a sleep routine? A sleep routine is literally an hour before bed, you're getting ready for bed. What does that look like? You dim the lights, you stop, your, turn off your electronics, or you wear blue light blocking glasses. You don't read or talk about or do anything that's stressful, and you allow your body to settle. I like to drink chamomile tea at this time, and you allow your body to settle and get ready to go to sleep. I think we often... You know, we either forget or we think it's not a big deal to just, we're watching TV, action movie, it's loud, lights are on, shut everything off, go hit the pillow, and I'm going to go right into sleep. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's going to take your, your brain an hour just to get to that point. Well, what if I got my brain there faster by having a sleep routine? And I've done this with clients where I said, I don't want to do anything else. Just an hour before, you know, put on your blue light blocking glasses or turn off your electronics and, you know, uh, turn, turn the lights way down and kind of get, get everything settled. And then see how your sleep improves. And eight out of ten times, we see dramatic improvements. It took me a long time to to figure this one out. And I don't know if that's like a, a, a youth thing or what. Like, 
maybe when you're young, you're just so resilient and you, or you, or you don't give a shit. You're not paying attention to these yeah, things. I don't think yeah. you care quite as much. Yeah. I, Cause I, I could make the case that, you know, even at, you know, 17, 20 years old, this is still valuable information. I totally. think, you, I think you just don't realize at that age, you know, I think you just kind of power through it and you are full of piss and vinegar. And so you don't realize how valuable it can be until you start to get a little bit older. And then it's cause it's very clear to me now, I'm sure it, all of us in this room have had times where you're, you're thinking about going to do something and you go, you choose not to because you know it's going to disrupt your sleep. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, I would love to go out there, but oh, that's going to be around nine and then I got to do this <laughs> and tomorrow I got to be up at this. I mean, you we kind of subconsciously start to do that as, as we get older. And it's funny that we put all this energy and effort into our morning routines. Everybody has these these, these crazy, there's books all around these morning oh, yeah. routines. Or even and, the pre-workout routine. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. We, we have these these routines that, and, and yet I could probably make the case, I'm sure you guys could too, that the the sleep, the nighttime is more valuable than any of those. Mm -hmm. Getting ready for your workout or getting ready for your day, sure, there's some value to that, absolutely. But I don't think there's more value to that than there is preparing yourself for bed where all this recovery recoup happens. And I think going into it, getting prepared for it and treating it the same way that you treat that pre-workout or treat the start of your day, that in itself, I think, is the way to it's step. It's so funny that it's just been an afterthought forever. And it, it does make so much impact on everything you're doing throughout the day that you're trying to adapt towards. Uh, and, and so to put some, some attention there and be really mindful about, um, you know, really gearing yourself, winding yourself down, allowing yourself to get in that parasympathetic state, uh, like Sal saying, kind of dim the lights, like remove the uh, electronics and whatnot. Like, it, I mean, I took it to the next level where every little bit I've noticed makes a, a big difference. Like not having lights, any light on in my bedroom, making it just dark, blackening it out yeah. made a huge difference. Like having a cool temperature makes a huge difference. And it's just interesting when you really put uh, more of your thoughts around that, uh, what that does when you wake up and how much more refreshed you feel. Wow. Yeah, I, I what we did is we bought these like nightlight salt lamps. So I like salt lamps because they glow kind of this amber color, which is, um, you know, kind of simulates flame. So it's a little less, you know, telling your brain less so that the sun is out. Unlike really bright, like well, the lights. Well, it's no blue light, right? Like, yeah, there's no blue light. And it's right. not like these bright, like overhead lights, right? That these, these are the most damaging. So we bought these little salt night lights and we put them throughout the house. And when it reaches a certain time, we turn all lights off and we turn those on. And it's enough light for you to get around and do stuff if you need to. But it really does set the mood. And what's funny is that uh, I, I did that for myself and my wife, and I noticed profound effects on my children. Oh, yeah. Because my kids were around it. They all went to bed earlier yeah, and same. went to sleep yeah. earlier. And then blue light blocking glasses. I love, you know, it's, I like to watch TV at night sometimes. If I put on really strong blue light blocking glasses and I watch a movie an hour before I want to go to sleep, I'm usually almost asleep 45 minutes in. Like I find myself drifting off. Drifting off. If I take those off, the light is bright enough to stimulate me to keep me awake much longer. And then it's harder to fall asleep. So a sleep routine just literally means an hour before you you want to be in bed, what your target time is, you just have your your little routine that you do. Just like like Adam said, pre-workout or your your before morning routine or your morning routine, just have them before and bed. And the first step to that is just giving a fuck. It's caring. Totally. It's, it's, it's actually, because I mean, honestly, that was... Uh, what kept me away from this for so long was I just didn't care. I just didn't, you know, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, mm -hmm. like, oh, I don't need sleep is overrated. You know, I had all these stupid <laughs> mantras that I used to yeah, say. Same, same. It was just so silly. And it's like, just by putting a little bit of effort, and I'm with you, I, I, I've continued to, like build upon that. Like Justin was saying, it's like, it started off with, oh, I'll just dim the lights. And then it was like, oh, now I've gotten like so routine that as soon as the sun goes down, the blue light blocking glasses come on, regardless if I'm on the computer or watching TV. I mean, they just, that's naturally sun's down. Those go on that way. If in case I walk in the bathroom and flip a light on or do anything, I'm not disrupting that. And then the Uller being able to use that at nighttime to cool my temperature down. That's been like game changing for me. And then the other one that you mentioned Sal lightly that I think is important that a lot of people don't do. Katrina knows this for sure is like, you cannot talk to me about work or business like yes. after 7 yeah. p.m. No like, finances. Over yeah, here. if yeah. we get into anything. No, you get a stressful conversation before yeah. bed. Forget and, you know, and I love work, right? So this this is actually a challenge for me. And, the, and so... Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't look like stress to you, right? Because you're like you love your passion about it, but you got to be careful because it winds the brain up and totally. it gets you. It gets your brain wide awake. And so I love business and I love to talk about that. So I don't really think of it like, oh, this is stressful. I can't talk about it. Like maybe finances can be stressful for people, 
but it just, it winds me up. Like it gets me going and I can't stop thinking. And like when I'm trying to settle my brain down, it's like the worst thing. So becoming aware of all this stuff, I think is the first step. And then figuring out those little hacks because somebody listening right now, maybe the blue light thing's not a big deal to you, but maybe like the temperature in your bed or the lights in your room, like you said, Justin, or just simply not talking about stuff, like starting to become aware of those things and, and start to get better and better at that process. And you improve that and you'll see it bleed into every other aspect of your life. Perfect. So there you have it. Six very easy, simple steps to help you get the best body of your life in the new year in 2022. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all the guides that we have. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I am at mindpumpsal and Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam. 